Okay. And are we recording? I didn't check. Yes. Okay, good. All right. Welcome, everyone. And we're going to go ahead and start with the open mic session. So here we go. So in continuing from the session today, um, Convergence Accelerator, uh, this is the workshop. This is the open mic session. And what we will be doing um, is what we will be doing in this session is brainstorming, just like they're doing in the breakouts, but we're going to be doing it in a larger format, a larger session. So I'm going to start first with laying the ground rules. This session is innovation, convergence, and acceleration. It's live. It's open mic. You're going to get to um, voice your thoughts and comments as we brainstorm. This session is being recorded. And here are the goals. So before we start, we're going to go over some of the goals and the ground rules during the open mic session and, and what we're trying to do. So we're going to share ideas and brainstorm about urgent challenges to advancing food security in extreme environments and food deserts, what you've heard so far from the talks earlier. Convergent ready solutions for addressing these challenges that, level, that leverage multidisciplinary teams and cross-sector partners to achieve societal impact. Clear goals and deliverables that will result in significant societal impact and what can be achieved in the next three years. So these are what we're wanting you to think about, what we will be asking of you shortly with some of our brainstorming questions. The format for open mic, so most of you are already familiar with, but if not, if you have your participants window open, um, once we ask a question, you can raise your hand. And here, if you're not familiar, we're showing you instructions to raise your hand. So from your participants window, there's an icon in the bottom right hand side where you can click on that. Your hand will be raised. You will be in order. We'll call you in order. So um, this, we're already up to 64 participants. You will have like I think you got muted, Deidre. Okay. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, so I was going over where to, how to raise your hand. Uh, most of you already know how to, and for some who don't, go to the participants window and raise your hand. You will be given, we'll call you in order. You appear in order. We will call you in order. You will have two minutes to um, voice your opinion um, to the question in the brainstorming session. So we'll, we will be covering calling several people, so we'll call you in order. Um, we can't call everyone. We have 70 people. We may have two or 300 people. So we have an, another activity that will be going on in parallel to collect your thoughts and ideas. So two minutes, like the lightning talks, when we call you, two minutes to, to brainstorm your ideas. Uh, we will be calling you. So we have um, another person here with us. We have our facilitator from Meridian, Gina, and we also have our MC, and her name is Ophelia Wells. So she will introduce you to the stage or the platform when your turn is called. So everyone will, will not get called to the stage. Others, you will collaborate via a whiteboard. So this is the link, we're gonna put it in the chat for you. So if someone can put that either in the chat or the Q&A, we're gonna use Padlet. And here's the link right here. So we'll get that in the chat or the Q&A, you can open that up. And so as we address a topic, you will put your comments. We ask that you put your comments there on that whiteboard and you'll see how. So you can get ready by starting and opening that up. We want you to get to know each other. So start right now. We encourage you to rename yourself. We're showing you right here on the screen how to rename yourself. Some of you already know how to do that. We Zoom experts now. Rename yourself. Uh, use your name, your preferred pronoun, if you would like, and your organizational affiliation. So in renaming yourself, remember throughout all of this, what we are trying to do is brainstorm 
solutions and ideas to this big problem. It is not one person. It's, it's going to be multiple disciplines, multiple organizations, multiple um, expertise. And so what we're also trying to do is get to know each other, because if you heard in the opening session, Mike said, uh, for phase one funding, that proposal will be coming up. So at the same time, we want to think about teaming while we're here. He's going to be looking for solicitations from 10 to, he will find Let's use this as an opportunity to also, um, let's use this as an opportunity to get to know each other to, in preparation for Teamy. That's all. So go ahead, rename yourself, open up Padlet and, and continuing with getting prepared. So if you can't hear or if others can't hear you, you may be being challenged with your audio settings. So this is just a tech tip for this Zoom meeting. You right to the right of your microphone, just click on the up arrow and choose the appropriate microphone and speaker, be it your headset or your system, if you're not hearing any audio or hearing us. Join the conversation. So we are, um, we're Instagram, Twitter, and then also you saw this morning, we're at, we're on Slack. So we're providing all of the links and all of the information, again, to build this community, to collaborate, to form teams, partnerships, as we go forward and discuss these ideas and brainstorm over the next three days. So join the conversation. Now we're gonna get ready to start. So we, we hope everyone um, has opened Padlet. The link is in your chat or in your Q&A. So here's the first question. The first question is, let me open my participants to get ready. The first question is, and we're brainstorming for our open mic, what are the most significant needs or challenges or barriers that stand in our way of ensuring food security? What, what's stopping us from doing that? And so if you have an answer, go ahead and raise your hand. We have someone's hand already raised. All right. We and others, okay. And others um, go into Padlet and start using the whiteboard to write down your answers. You'll see right on the greatest challenges, that first, um, that first little note, just start creating your answers under that first column. What are the most significant challenges? What we're going to try to do is for each question or topic, get stay there around 15 minutes, which gives us maybe five people per question at two minutes per person. It's not fixed in concrete. We may have more questions. If we may not have, we may not spend a lot of time on one question that might give us more time for another question. So it's just open mic, we wanna discuss. So we will not be uh, doing this in the chat. We're gonna be doing this, we wanna verbalize this. We're taking a different approach to, to the way that it's typically done. So we're doing it, I call it old school open mic. This, work, this works well in my classroom and in lectures, I get the most engagement when we talk about a problem. So question number one, challenges. What are the most significant needs, challenges or barriers that stand in our way of ensuring food security? And the first person, Yes, yeah, so we'd like to welcome Faslina to the stage. Feel free to uh, take yourself off mute. Okay, uh, thank you. Uh -huh. uh, thank you. My name is uh, Faslina Badudin. I'm a professor in mechanical engineering at the University of Kentucky. And my research and work is in the manufacturing systems and supply chain area. Uh, so we had some really good keynotes. I think they were very eye-opening. So good topics over there. Uh, but one of the topics I think that didn't get covered as much, obviously we didn't have time to cover everything, was the, uh, uh, the topic of food waste. So about 40% of the food that is produced is, goes to waste uh, here in the US and across the globe. And I think that is part of one of the biggest problems that we have in terms of addressing the uh, you know, food security, which also needs to be given equal attention when trying to address this um, problem that we are facing. And um, 
even in uh, some of the very advanced, uh, you know, tech tech driven um, agri uh, businesses that um, I cannot name, but that are around us. Uh, that we are, for example, here in uh, the University of Kentucky, that are very familiar with. We see that even with all the advances in technology that they are using, there's still about 30% of the food that goes to waste at the farm, uh, between transporting uh, from the farmers to the consumers, and then at the retail and supply chain level. So I think that's one of the problems that needs to be addressed as well. Okay, all right, good, thank you. And you are right, um, there, there, it wasn't in the keynote, but there, I saw a lightning talk where there's a couple, a company, um, and they're also one of the keynote speakers. There's a video where they are addressing food waste and they have a company and they're showing how they're getting people to bring in food waste and they're using that in a large way and doing soil engineering. And I found that very interesting. So thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Next, let's have our one. Mm -hmm. Great points there. Now we welcome Stephen to the stage. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Thank you so much for the opportunity to speak. My name is Stephen Boss. I'm a professor of environmental dynamics and sustainability at the University of Arkansas in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And I consider one of the grand challenges for our food supply is largely cultural. And that is the food is a cultural construct. So what you consider to be food is often what you're taught as food. And there remain significant cultural barriers worldwide and in many cultures to the introduction of different types of foods, specifically the introduction of insect protein into the diets of many cultures worldwide because of cultural prohibitions or cultural aversions to that kind of um, food source. So I think one of our biggest issues is simply just addressing the cultural construct of food. Okay, all right, good. Thank you for that, Stephen. And I think one of the speakers, I think, was it um, Dr. John Pete Martin Blum from John Hopkins? I think he was talking about that a little bit. He alluded to that and getting society to accept certain types of food. Like I think when he was talking about they engineered the brown rice and then it may have not been accepted by that culture. So um, thank you for that. Okay, next. Yeah, great comments. Now we welcome Padu to the stage. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, hi, uh, I'm a, a faculty uh, in uh, at George Mason University and uh, uh, my background is in computational mathematics and uh, scientific computing and data science. Uh, and I was a former program director of the NSF also. And uh, so one of the things I wanted to piggyback on the first comment, uh, you know, we tend to think about food waste. That food waste is something very important, connects to the United Nations uh, goal number two, zero hunger. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, we tend to talk about, I mean, there was a nice comment made on the where, where all it gets wasted. But one place that many people can rethink is K-12. Uh, there was a survey done uh, on an average, uh, an elementary school kid wastes about 1.13 pounds of food every week. Uh, a high school kid wastes 0.35 pounds, 0.35, that's correct, pounds of food every week. Uh, middle schooler wastes 0.72 pounds of food every week. Now, the times the number of students, just a simple Fermi back of the envelope calculation will show the millions of dollars we can, we, uh, we actually weigh, I mean, it gets wasted just in the school system. So uh, thinking about how to, uh, enhance, uh, uh, integrate uh, curriculum inside, you know, educational, uh, you know, using food as a context uh, and uh, trying to build a curriculum map and turning that curriculum map into an integrated content. And from that integrated content, create pedagogical concepts and then lead to competencies for students involving creativity, critical thinking, communication, collaboration, citizenship. We keep talking about competencies but we need to connect the context to the competencies in school systems also. Just wanted to add that. Okay, all right, hold on one second, Padu. I have a question for you. So what I've heard right now from the last few um, people who have come up is food waste. Um, with this food waste, one of the speakers talked about they were trying to fix one problem we had in our society, but in their attempt to fix that problem, it resulted in another problem where we overeat. And then in overeating, now we have obesity and we have diseases and we have um, health issues. But all of that stemmed from another policy. 
in this country where they were trying to um, address food in some aspect. I don't remember the end, the beginning of that. But do you think the food waste is part of the obesity? And if so, what's the solution? What can we do to, to stop this food waste? Well, a great, great point. I just, I think you're, I mean, all these are connected, you know, even though, mm -hmm. for example, United Nations put 17 goals, uh, you know, starting with poverty and hunger and the SDG four is actually education. So I, mm -hmm. I put my money on education. So if we actually can build okay. good tools on the education, I think we can connect uh, all these different things. And uh, yes, so I think okay. even though they are at policy level, I guess we are all uh, assigned, I mean, we're all coming together just to create how does that policy become curriculum? I think that, that yeah, and yeah. research, I think that's where the key is, I think. Okay, okay, thank you. That's strange. In parts of the world, we have food insecurity, and now in these areas, we have food waste. So, okay, all right, next. Yeah, great points, next. yeah. Uh -huh. Thanks for the great conversation. Kwame, we welcome you to the stage if you'd like to take yourself off mute. Thank you. So my name is Kwame Wolf. I am a Professor of Mining Engineering at Missouri University of Science and Technology. And I think one of the big challenges I see, particularly in poorer nations, is the competition for land use, right? So poverty puts pressure on people to do things in order to generate an income. And sometimes in those activities, it degrades land. So for example, from a mining perspective, High prices in gold, for example, has meant that lots of artisanal mines, whether legal or illegal, are mining in places that degrade the land, degrade water resources, and in the process harms food production. But, but these people are driven primarily by poverty to do more, uh, you know, to use the land in order to generate income for themselves, and yet that causes problems. Another piece of that is as we drive towards green energy, there's huge estimates of minerals that need to be mined in order to produce the batteries and the green energy infrastructure. And especially with what, I, as a mining engineer, I see the gap between what mines are able to produce and the demand, that is likely to create in the next few years um, an uptick in illegal artisanal mining to fill the gap, which would further make this problem bigger. So I think we just need to be thinking about competing needs for land users in poorer countries that make food production difficult. Okay, all right, good. Thank you for that, Kwame. And one of the things that one of the speakers said this morning that I hadn't realized, um, the production of meat, they're using more land, more agricultural land to produce meat than, than food. And then that was not sustainable also. So, you know, I was not aware of that. So this is becoming very, um, very interesting. How do we solve this? So I hope everyone is putting information into Padlet as well as solutions. Um, as we begin to think about the problem, let's also think about some solutions. And one question that I put out there to you if, we, if, if the land is being used inappropriately where we can't use it for food, there is a lot of land that um, the dry lands, the arid land, there's a lot of land there. How can we use that for agriculture, for food? You know, just keep that in mind, just some thoughts. Okay, the next person. Yeah, so Kiruba, mm -hmm. we welcome you to the stage. Please feel free to take yourself off mute. Okay. Thank you. Uh, to address Deirdre's question about one side, we have food insecurity. On the other side, we have food waste. So this is like kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because we have around 821 million people affected by chronic hunger. But on the other, like, you know, there was a speaker who was talking about micronutrient deficiencies that affects more than 2 billion people. And that's where the spectrum, like, you know, it's an umbrella, imagine an umbrella, one side you have stunting and wasting, and the other side, overweight and obesity. And this is what we call as the double burden of malnutrition. It's hidden and it's, it's a very, very uh, dangerous concept compared to chronic hunger. On the other hand, we waste 1.3 billion tons of edible food getting wasted. So if we uh, cha like, you know, change our perspectives, because in nature, there is nothing called waste. Waste is a terminology that's created by humans. If we could understand how nature transforms 
products into usable things, then we will be having solutions to address the others the needs of changing the food waste into edible products that could feed the people. So creating a cycle that is more sustainable rather than a linear uh, system. Okay, all right, good. All right, thank you for that, Kiruba. Thank you. Now, and as we continue and we talk about everyone we're bringing to light, some of the challenges, and these are good. I had not realized these, but now when you go back, be thinking about for me, and I use this in my class, engineering 101, what's the solution? What's the solution? So be pondering upon that as we hear from others. So next. Yeah, and as we think about what's some of the topics added to, to Padlet, um, the next category is around big ideas to advance, which touches on the solutions. One of the big ideas added here is getting emerging, emerging technologies in the hands of farmers worldwide and provide the necessary infrastructure so they can utilize these effectively. Uh, so for the next speakers, if, if you'd like to speak to some of the big ideas to advance, that'd be great as well. And so now we welcome uh, Eunice to the stage. Please feel yeah. free to take yourself off mute. And Eunice, what we just did, um, Eunice, we switched to the second topic on you. We're going to get through a few topics. So if you're still fixed on with your response on your first, on the topic that you had, that's okay also. So I think my, to topic, huh? I think my topic spans, my, my question or comment spans both topics. I was okay, just, good, good. So good. everyone, we went to question two, big ideas. Um, we're trying to do maybe 15 minutes a topic or a question. And if there's a burning topic that we haven't put down here and you wanna cover that, um, let us know. So question number two, what are the most promising mechanisms or opportunities for addressing these challenges and overcoming hurdles of food security? What are some of the solutions? Okay, so go ahead. Okay, as I said, I think my comment spans both. Okay. Uh to do with the insufficient numbers of individuals who are coming into the agricultural food systems in terms of our, through our educational system into our undergraduate and graduate programs. We have insufficient numbers of scientists for the workforce, as scientists for the research, scientists for the future. Uh, we also have very, very, very little diversity of those agricultural scientists or individuals in the workforce, as well as coming through the industry. And I think that also uh, goes back to the fact that we have poor educational systems in many of our um, under-resourced communities that we have been hearing a lot about that have come to the fore with regard to COVID-19 we've become aware of. So all of that is interrelated. We can't throw away part of our human resources that we need uh, for the development of our world and then expect to have all the answers that we need. So all of that is... Yeah. The system we're talking about convergence, I think it all fits together. So thank okay. you. Okay. All right. Great comments, Eunice. And you're right. Uh, one of the speakers talked about this morning, the average age of farmers, 65, that the young people are not wanting to go to farmers. They're going to urban areas. And now you're highlighting another problem that I had not realized. I know USDA have a lot of funding opportunities for the pipeline for students in this area, but you know, are not getting the pipeline or the numbers that they want to see. And now if we're not getting the age of the young people wanting to go into this in agriculture, then you know, how do we sustain this? How do we grow food? You know, if the farmers are not going to be there and we can't get students in the pipeline and we don't have um, equity in the system that we do have, you know, how do we sustain this? What's the solution? Engineering 101. Be thinking about that. Next person. Yeah, great topics. We welcome to the stage uh, Basil Deher, Texas A&M. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Hello, everyone, and, and thank you for this opportunity. Uh, uh, one thing that comes to mind uh, after listening to today's uh, insightful presentations and, and looking at this question is I mean, food security is a complex challenge, and it is connected with water and energy security and uh, which requires a high level of collaboration between uh, uh, institutions, organizations, different stakeholders across these different sectors. Uh, yet we see uh, little uh, coordination or, or communication happening across these uh, sectors. And, and this is what, one thing we've seen over several case studies. We've worked on, on, on several 
water energy food nexus hotspots uh, in the US and, and globally. And one of the things we, we learned from a recent um, uh, NSF funded infuse actually in, here in Texas was uh, that lack of, of communication uh, was less a result of the lack of capacity or knowledge uh, for the need for that communication, but more uh, the lack of uh, uh, coordination uh, mechanisms or, or uh, mandates of the institutions themselves that allow them or uh, allocates resources for them to do this kind of outreach and coordination across different mechanisms uh, across different institutions. So, uh, so as we brainstorm and think of different solutions, uh, in addition to thinking about the technical and engineering solutions, I think uh, it's it's important also to have a fresh look at the the mandates and the uh, the mechanisms of the different uh, institutions and organizations that are involved in food security related issues and and to uh, see if there's a need to revisit some of those uh, in order to uh, facilitate the process of of further collaboration across them. Okay, all right, excellent, Basel. Thank you for that comment. And you're right, now the infrastructure is being put into place. For example, NSF does have the um, Infuse program, but with this program, you have to be interdisciplinary. You have to be a team. You know, we're so used to being silos and getting funding on our own, but now that day is over. You know, NSF and others know that the solutions take a big team. So you're going to see more and more um, instruments and funding opportunities out there. We're already seeing it. it. The calls are for team science, you know, multidisciplinary. We see universities already, you know, in, instituting in, interdisciplinary programs, but it's not easy. Even in the universities, there's a lot of pushback from faculty for these interdisciplinary programs. We have to go up in our tenure promotion uh, process where you know faculty are not being rewarded for interdisciplinary research. So you know we do need a shift all around where the the system, the infrastructure has to be there to support it in the in the institutions, but the funding agencies are taking the lead. So you heard Michael say this morning he will not entertain a proposal from phase one for food security if it does not have a team, a real team, not just, uh, for example, faculty in engineering. He wants to see a team of faculty across disciplines, psychology, education, policy. He wants to see multiple stakeholders in that proposal. If he doesn't see a true proposal like that, it will not be accepted. So types of programs out there, I think they're moving toward that with the funding and universities are trying to move toward that with setting up into disciplinary programs to go after these. And it's because that's where the solution is. And you heard one speaker say it this morning, um, Martin from NREL, he said, you know, it's, it's not easy. He showed some of, he talked about some of the stakeholders and going out there to do that for us. The organizing committee, we had to come together. We were different disciplines. First, we had to communicate. You know, we each were we each experts in our own area and we used to doing things our own ways. You know, it wasn't easy for us to come together, but we kept working at it. We kept coming together. We, we converged, we converged and we did it in an accelerated pace, but it, it wasn't easy, it was work. But I think the tools are out there and that shift is starting and it's, it's happening. So thank you for that comment. Next. We welcome Hernando to the stage. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Hi, uh, thank you for the invitation. I'm uh, extremely, uh, uh, lots of information to digest in such a short period of time. And, uh, you know, we always think about the problems and then, uh, you know, how about the solutions, right? Solution, yes. And that's, uh, that's, uh, that's, a, big, that's a big if. Mm -hmm. One of the areas of uh, major concern uh, we the, are uh, basically the startups and bringing new technologies to the world. God bless for the investors if they show up, right? Mm -hmm. But at the end of the day, uh, to make it sustainable, we want to make sure that we have the proper portable water uh, away from the possibility of uh, contaminants that could make the areas where either pharma, uh, pharmaceuticals and or 
uh, you know, food is being processed. Uh, so that's essential. Uh, yes. the, uh, the, 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 the issue of the pandemic, or, or we all know the pandemic, you know, with coronavirus and SARS and all that. But let's also think about the animals, you know, birds and be as uh, cattle and horses and, and pigs are, uh, you know, they also have their pandemics. You know, the swine flu is a big issue because of the, you know, the, the possibility of uh, cross, cross uh, infection with humans. So uh, <clears throat> I think that the solution is to put emphasis in companies like ourselves to be able to bring these new technologies so that we can, A, for example, eradicate uh, the, the swine flu and also to provide sustainability with, uh, with water. Okay. All right. so, my, yeah. Okay, and I agree. Thank you for that comment. I agree. Com um, companies such as yours, industry, are part of this team, you know, are part of the solution. So a very important part, and I agree. So thank you for that. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, uh-huh. Next. We'd like to invite James to the stage. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Uh, thank you. So one simple solution, which is uh, in place but needs to be expanded, uh, I think, dramatically, is the community gardening. And I, I say that because it addresses uh, three issues that people have been, been talking about uh, with a relatively simple solution. One, obviously, it is a source of new fresh food in food deserts that don't really have access to that uh, fresh food. So that's just a practical concern. Uh, the other is what Eunice uh, was bringing up about the pipeline of food producers and, and scientists who may want to be interested in, in, in uh, agriculture or food production. I think if you uh, blend this into the educational system early on, students become um, more interested in the soils and, and the plants and create that pipeline, not only increase the number of people interested in it, but also increase the diversity of people um, interested in uh, agriculture and growing food. Uh, and the third thing is, I think that's really critical, especially in this country, is changing our attitude towards food. All this discussion about food waste, I, I, I believe a lot of the food waste is because people have such a, a disregard and, and don't have, you know, think how important it's so easy to get food that it's easy uh, easy to waste. The other aspect of, is on the consumption side where people eat very unhealthy food. Whereas if you're growing your own fruits, fruits and vegetables, I think uh, young people growing up will be more apt to eat those fruits and vegetables and change their habits to a healthier uh, diet uh, early on. Okay, all right, good. Thank you for that, Dr. Kabiki. Thank you, and I agree. Um, so the mass populations, and one of the speakers talked about this, are, are the, the big cities, the urban areas. So if mass populations are in, in the urban areas and the young people are there, but the fresh food is not, you know, community gardens, you know, and if we can get the community gardens into these big urban areas and in the educational program, get students involved in that, um, I think this would be a win-win. I totally agree, community gardens, bring it into the big populations such that you're bringing the fresh food into the populations. And, and part of that, we, we have speakers tomorrow on control, controlled, um, agriculture, controlled environment agriculture. So in addition to community gardens, we can use big vacant warehouse buildings to grow this fresh food tie it into the education program, involve young people. And I think that's a solution toward um, getting healthy food into the system, getting younger people involved and, and using without using soil and land, just another approach for that um, big city. Thank you for that. Next. We'd like to welcome Judy to the stage. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Yeah, hi, this is Judy Zhang from Case Western Reserve University. I'm a professor in environmental engineering. So I, I want, want to come back to the emphasis on food waste we talked about earlier. I do feel two of the most promising technologies to address food waste problems are anaerobic digestion and combusting. But both processes now should be much more efficient in terms of converting the waste into energy 
and or value added products. Also, there is a lot of contaminants or toxins in these wastes, such as antibiotics, hormones, pesticides, et cetera, et cetera. How to safely treat this waste really needs to be addressed. So there's a lot of needs for te technology development in this space. Okay, all right. Thank you for that, Judy. Yeah, and I agree. So we have to consider that in the food waste. So let's not just let it go to waste, but let's use it in a sustainable way recognizing the risk in this waste. Thank you for that, Judy. Okay, next. We'd like to welcome Ruby of the University of Illinois Arbana to the stage. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Thank you. Um, the comments are really interesting. And so just the one that I want to add to is about diversity and this idea of um, community science where you really work with um, individuals from the community. So I was even wondering what would it mean to, um, as people submit proposals, that they also have to have a significant representation from the community. And then when we talked about the pathway programs, that's a way too to engage young people and things that they love that they're doing um, already. So we're starting a farm bot program, right? Where we'll have um, little robots kind of plant and water seeds both in a farming area, but also in community gardens. And then we also talked about um, trying to link it to music and seeing if we could put sensors um, as the plants grow and seeing what kind of sounds that creates and how could we link that to students who love music production. Or even um, Carter G. Woodson was a a wonderful example of an artist who would paint these beautiful pictures um, of plants. So really, again, thinking about all the things that kids love and then layering um, um, agriculture, food development and things like that on top of it. And that's also part of um, the many land grant universities around the country, that's their mission and that's what they do. Thank you. Okay. All right, good. Thank you for that. Thank you. Oh, um, and I'm I sorry, like, one more uh -huh. thing. And then also uh -huh. incorporating it into schools, we're working with school systems. So when kids have electives to take, that they could take the electives with our program and that way they're in team science. They're working with a lot of scientists already and they're getting the um, school credit, high school credit. Okay, all right, that's excellent. I love that, working with the schools and the kids and food and music so that they can make that connection and embrace it. Um, that is excellent. And so before we call the next, speaker, I just want to remind everybody, I hope you're putting these rich ideas. Remember, we're brainstorming. So I hope you're updating Padlet. I can't see that. So I hope you're updating Padlet. And also, um, just as a reminder, we have Slack, a community cha channel. So we're trying to build community. So as you listen to each other, I want you to um, listen to what each other is doing and make the connections because, you know, the big solution, we want a team, we want to collaborate, we want to get to know each other, develop community, but we also want to prepare for phase one. So listen to each other, let's make connections and, um, and prepare to team for a bigger solution for the next step. Okay, next person. And then we're going to change questions after this person. We're going to go to question three after the next person. Yes. Sure. So we welcome back Padu to the stage. Feel free to take yourself okay. off mute. Thank you. Uh, so I, I, this is just a, sum, a summary. Data totally multidisciplinary themes is the way to go. So you yeah. know, I see myself as a computational mathematician and a scientific computing and mathematical modeling uh, to the food side. And then I, I do need people to tell me, I mean, I need experts that I need to listen to to help me understand why I'm modeling something uh, that's okay. important and why it's something is not important. Two, Ruby, I'm totally, you know, I'm a big uh, fan of what we can do uh, creatively in education. So in the dual enrollment space is very big. And I think today we live in an era of, uh, with COVID online learning, reskilling and upskilling is a big thing. So the more certificates, the more minors, the yep. more uh, uh, cross-discipline bridge programs that we can have for students to say major in mechanical engineering, minor in food technology, or major in food technology and minor in mathematics. So I think that is the real deal in terms of uh, you know creating the next generation future i mean future workforce and i think that is one way 
to bring colleges together because you know i know it's not always that we can bring colleges very easily under a umbrella but students can be a great vehicle nsf loves engaging students so you know so this is uh, something and the third thing is the community piece uh, cultural piece uh, i i practice design thinking and the very first step in design thinking is empathy without doing a good empathy jumping into a problem solution is is not going to get us anything so you got to have the empathy first the needs assessment and then do the problem statement definition and then do the uh, you know uh, the uh, ideation and then the prototyping and then testing and this goes back to judy's point this day and age kids are all looking to create the next biggest technology so we are also we also have an opportunity to turn food into a social entrepreneurship aspect so mm -hmm. not only can they create those next generation technologies but also work with data so i think there is that angle that that can also attract more people to get into this just wanted to add that so okay thank all you. right good thank thank you for that padu and to that point you said like your expertise is modeling and just as a reminder i'm listening to different people and your expertise and just as a reminder, um, if you look at the breakout sessions, so we have the breakout sessions, you know, based on the different topical areas within expertise. So we have agriculture, we have energy, we have materials, we have water. So they're into their silos right now. But after that breakout session, they have to come back together and integrate. Right now in this open mic session, we're already into the integrated session. But to Padu's point, you know, we have our expertise, but we have to get, I think, in that new role of working in an integrated fashion to solve a problem. And I think some schools and some curriculums are, are doing that already. And I know NSF have this one program, the NRT, where they are funding PhD students with fellowships. And with these, with their fellowships, one of the requirements or the PhD students have to experience different disciplines and work in different labs with doing research. So they don't just go into a silo. So, you know, I, I think the shift is happening. Um, it would be nice if we can move the needle a little faster, um, but it's happening. And I think for all of us, we know our areas of expertise, but if we can start moving out into other areas, that's, that has brought me into this area you know, my area is solar photovoltaics and radiation detection and materials and all of this science, but um, I have empathy um, with interdisciplinary research and the problems, the social problems of society. In my mind, there's always a solution. We have technology to fix this. And so I've engaged interdisciplinary research. That's caused work on my part. I'm having to learn that language and what are their concerns with health? I'm having yeah. to learn diabetes and these issues. And yeah. now with food, I'm having to learn agriculture. So it's, it's work, but it's bringing together a better solution. And it's yeah. helping make me better and helping me think about solutions in a better way. All Absolutely. right. Absolutely. So, so okay. with that, Dr. Rogers, it seems we, we have a, um, a hint to kind of pick up the pace. So it sounds like we, right. we have some more folks who want to um, be able to jump on stage and then open their mics. So we welcome okay. Fazlina to the stage. Okay, and do we change uh, questions at this point? Hold on, Fazlina, you okay. keep your thought, but let me also change questions in case the other people are in line. If they can shift, and if they can't, we'll just let them come with their thoughts. But for those, here's question number three, goals and impacts. What are the positive societal impacts these solutions will have in a three-year time frame? Um, what are the solutions? How will they impact society? We talked a lot about the problems. What are solutions? Will they have a big impact to society? And can these solutions be implemented in three years? Consider social and environmental benefits. We're hearing a lot right now about environmental justice, even energy justice, um, economic. So what are the economic gains? What's about policy, diversity, equity, and inclusion? We're hearing a lot about that lately. So think big. If you had to think out the box, you know, just think big. If you had everything you need, what would be the ideal situation, the perfect solution? What would be transformative and disruptive? What can be done in three years? What can be done in 10 years? So with that, we'll go ahead and open the mic up for the next person. 
Thank you, Deidre. So uh, um, as, as I mentioned previously, my background and my research is mostly in manufacturing systems and supply chains. And we uh, our focus has been mostly you know, discrete product manufacturing. Uh, and uh, I wanted to share one of the kind of principles that we use in district, discrete product manufacturing to increase sustainability and closed loop material flow that can be adapted in food systems and food supply chains uh, to reduce waste and promote circularity. So uh, we, we always use an approach called the six R's. Uh, you know, we are all familiar with reduce, reuse, recycle, and we've added three more R's to that to say recover, reuse, and remanufacture, because uh, when you look at recycle or, you know, um, technologies like, you know, uh, taking the food and converting it to energy, we have wasted most of the, uh, you know, embedded energy that went into creating the product or creating the food item. So by recycling and converting it to energy, we are pretty much wasting what is already there. So what we, what, what we try to promote is promoting reuse, you know, try to find alternate channels for reuse and maybe remanufacture. And so this in the context of food systems would be trying to maybe use the newer technologies to sense the you know, life of shelf lives of food and before it goes to waste to try to find uh, you know, food kitchens or you know, regional uh, you know, uh, community kitchens that can use this food and try to reduce the amount of food that goes to waste and promote circularity in food supply chain. So that's, that's a principle we have used in manufacturing systems and supply chains, but I think there's, um, you know, it can be applied in food supply chains as well. Okay, all right, that's good, Faslina. Do you know um, circularity in food supply chains? You know, is it a requirement right now or are people just doing it because it's the right thing to do? Is it a policy? Um, well, it depends. I think if you look at some of the European countries, they have uh, very strict re requirements. Uh, uh, for example, uh, France, uh, in some, some of the cities have imposed requirements that they have to look at what happens to the food uh, you know, that is not used in restaurants and retail organizations. So it is very regional. Uh, but there is a large community that is engaged in food-based uh, related research and trying to uh, create uh, supply chains uh, that are you know, focusing on reducing food waste. And we have done some preliminary work in that area, kind of trying to uh, think about applying these six R's in the food supply chains. Okay, all right, good. Thank you for that. All right. And notice that's another group of people that, that they, they are here. And those are our policy bakers and they are here at the conference and we can see why now. Okay, next. So we welcome back Ruby to the stage. You can feel free to take yourself off mute. Hi, um, yes, I was just going to talk about the idea of citizen scientists as well, right? When we talked about um, one of the speakers said human capital and then we talked about certificates. And literally, uh, and when you think big, right, kind of imagine scaling up and exponential growth, what would it mean to be able to train entire communities, developing like an online um, curriculum, and then also letting them um, take the classes at their pace and becoming experts, and then also letting them um, have stackable credentials as we talk about. And so maybe that's how they start out. And, and again, even as community health workers, we're doing some of that training of the high school students um, using Morehouse College of Medicine's curriculum. But then those students who they love it or community members who love it, then there's a next stage and a next stage. So literally you could have an ecosystem where um, many people do have some of the basic and then you have these um, more experts who then um, create community programming from art to just a whole way of disseminating the latest science that's out there. Oh, Rudy, that is excellent. I hope you've documented that because now I see that as a solution to the pipeline. I see that mm -hmm. as a solution to getting young people involved. I see that as a solution to workforce development. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. was in a meeting, um, a Department of Energy meeting, and there was a provost from a university there. And she said that they're getting more participation in from a group that they normally don't get to participate in their programs, internships, 
Mm-hmm. During COVID, they got more students to participate in their internships during COVID because they made it online and virtual, mm-hmm. yeah. where face-to-face, they would have low participation in these internships. So what you're saying, if you can train this community that we're trying to reach to, if we can make something online with these citizen scientist type programs and they get certificates, mm-hmm. I see this as a solution. <laughs> So yeah. my light bulb is going off. So I hope that's documented somewhere and that you put it in Padlet. Um, yeah, I, yeah, yeah, I did. And then also they, some of them won't even need college degrees, right? They'll have yeah. the expertise and they'll be working with the scientists. Yeah. So it yeah. really is a way for them to get in touch with scientists and be a part yes. of it, but don't necessarily yes. need the credentials that are often really, really big barriers. Yes, yes. And that meeting that was on workforce development you know, it was about a broken pipeline. We have a workforce that's there, but they're not knowledgeable about opportunities or yeah. lack just a few skills, you know, and so we're trying to connect the dots. And this is, sounds like a great solution to do that. Right. Okay, good. Thank you. Thank you for that. Okay. Next. Uh-huh. We welcome Amitava to the stage. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Thank you. Uh, thank you, first of all, to give me the opportunity to be part of this you know, wonderful uh, uh, workshop and um, all the wonderful and extremely knowledgeable and talented people, all of you. I'm learning a lot. Um, I'm from the San Diego Supercomputer Center at the University of California, San Diego, and I also have an affiliated faculty position at the UCSD Med School. So my uh, interest and uh, background are you know, cyber infrastructure and, and data. So as I'm hearing all these fascinating, uh, you know, discussions, um, you know, whether it's food waste or you know, food food security, all of these, uh, I was wondering, you know, how the information, you know, the, the the like, you know, there is knowledge. It seems that you know some places food are wasted, where obviously other places food are needed. I would guess even within this, you know, metropolitan San Diego area, there might be schools where food are wasted. Whereas in the same San Diego metropolitan area, there might be other uh, uh, you know, school districts where maybe those wasted food could have been transferred. Yes. So I'm just wondering, wondering. Okay, good question. Oh, and you, got, you have me excited right now. I communicated to a lot of people through emails or in registrations wondering how they even fit in. So with your cybersecurity and your big data, one, you heard one of the speakers talk about today, um, Martin from NREL with right. cybersecurity. Because now with deploying a lot of these systems, there's wireless and communications and networks. In fact, that's some of the breakouts that's going on. And so with, and sensors to monitor soil, to monitor plant growth and all of this other science. So with all of these sensors and these systems, we're collecting a lot of data and we're using artificial intelligence and machine learning. Right in these wireless systems. So we just saw what happened with the pipeline right. the pipeline last week um, with our system here at UTEP. So right. cybersecurity is very important. Big data is very important. But with that, I just want you to keep in mind, you just gave me another thought of tying together these, an app or some kind of system. How can, you know, using an app or a system to tackle food waste. Exactly. So I'd like you to bite on that and run right. with that because that right. could right. be a three-year deliverable that has a big impact. Exactly. You know, think about hospitals, restaurants, right. and school systems, high right. schools and colleges, everyone that feed large groups of people. If you right. can develop some kind of app or some kind of system to track um, exactly. that have food and make a connection, you know, to me, that's fundable. Exactly. So that's a solution. I hope you capture that in Padlet, and I love that. Yeah, so, I'll say, okay. Yeah. So okay. exactly, you just said all, all right. the things I wanted to say. You know, capture real time data yeah. and make decision and yeah. use AI and you know yeah. computing and make it available through some kind of app or abstraction yeah. layer to the farmer or the supply chain manager who doesn't have to worry about the AI research, right? Yes. But he and she can make a decision, okay, tornado coming in next three days, what should I do with my supply chain, right? Yes. If AI could provide him or her answer, so exactly, yes. use a technology, cyber infrastructure, computing, and AI. That's what I was thinking. Uh, yes. And I will mention one little thing, you know, because we're talking about team science, I participated in a proposal is still under review where 13 institutions joined together for institute proposals. So for last four months, we worked through Saturday and Sundays in all time zone. That yeah. was wonderful to have 14 institute, institutions wow. in a proposal. Wow. And I thought Ohio State. So we are still in okay. the final rounds. So I'll keep my mouth shut, but all right. I'm learning well, good a lot. Luck. 
thanks for the opportunity to interact with all of you. You're right. And I'm learning a lot, like you said. So I'm enjoying this learning a lot. And I thought, you know, having four or five, you know, on a proposal was a lot. But now that you're sharing, yours is 13. So that's that's team science. And that's the way. All right. Thank you for that. And next. Mm -hmm. So uh, before we welcome Eunice back to the stage, it sounds like we're sort of transitioning actually from looking at what could have an impact. Is it feasible uh, to have an impact within three years to some of the high impact deliverables? Um, so it sounds like uh, everyone's transitioning. Do feel free to check out the link to Padlet in the chat uh, if you'd like to add more ideas. And with that, we welcome Eunice back to the stage. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Thank you. I wanted to just jump back in regarding what I meant and what was I've heard with regard to education and share some of the things that we've been doing. We've also had a grant that has been working with uh, increasing the pipeline because there are disciplines. I was thinking of disciplines like animal science, entomology, crop and soil science, fisheries and wildlife, forestry, horticulture, that most people, regardless of where they are in the U.S., do not know about these careers. They do mm -hmm. not um, these areas of science, nor do school counselors. So one of the, one aspect of ours has been working with the, our local school district. Before COVID, we were going once a month after school with hands-on activities and also talking about key, careers to introduce them. Since COVID, we've been doing virtual, but we also paired that with, with scholarships so that as we're recruiting, because part of it is funding for students to be able to come into these different careers. And once they come into these different disciplines, Pairing that with undergraduate research, with internships, there is a great need to increase the pipeline. I don't think most people understand. People will say biology, they'll say chemistry, they'll say engineering. Those are all important disciplines, but the other ones that I named are important too. And most people don't know about them. And one of the other things that we've been working on is a type of e-badging system. So that we want to develop a curriculum to have badging to help people get introduced wherever they are to hopefully begin to increase that pipeline. So we need, need many different um, avenues of increasing that pipeline. And I mentioned earlier, diversing it, diversifying it. There's very, very, very little diversity other than gender diversity has been increasing, but the racial ethnic diversity is extremely low in all of those ones. So I, I just wanted to come back and make sure that you fully explained what I'm talking about and the yes. need for these particular increasing that pipeline. Yes. So thank you for that very much, Eunice. And to that, I want to add, you know, so we get trained, you know, as faculty, as researchers and scientists, we work one area, one problem. Um, and we get so comfortable in that. We spend our whole lives on that. But now there we have to transition to what you're saying, Eunice. Right now, there's a lot of um, the solution and the funding is in what Eunice was just speaking to. Right now, there are a lot of pipeline grants out there right now. There's a lot of diversity, equity, and inclusion um, requests for proposals out there right now, a lot of workforce development, a lot of undergraduate research opportunity. So, you know, for me, I was still trying to go back into that silo, but now I see you know, the funding is not into the silo. The funding is into the real world solutions of pipeline, d &I, workforce development. And so I've opened myself up to be interdisciplinary and to be a part of that big picture solution and to get out of my silo. The silo is comfortable and easy, but the answer is not there. And to what you're saying, um, under the current administration, there, there are a lot of this, these are where the funding opportunities are coming down the pipeline, not only with NSF, but also with Department of Energy, but also USDA. You know, they want the pipeline. Um, they want the pipeline. They want diversity, equity, and inclusion in that pipeline. In fact, the meeting that I was in with Department of Energy, President Biden signed um, an order called Justice 40. So if you're not familiar with that, Google that where 40% of departments of energy funding has to go to underrepresented groups, 40%. That is huge, that is huge. That will move the needle. So the things that are taking place, NSF are doing things similarly that will cause the needle to move in a large way. So for those, 
if I have some people in this group of over 90, if you're still silo oriented, I want you to start thinking about pipeline. In fact, that's one of the tracks for this whole project for we're talking about food security and, and we heard Michael from NSF talk about the tracks. You know, one track that they, he keeps highlighting is workforce development and diversity, equity, and inclusion. You know, so, and what can we do for the pipeline with undergraduates in research in K through 12? So I've been doing a lot of research on that and what, you know, and embracing. So keep that in mind for those that are out there. All right, we're gonna change questions. Thank you for that. That was Eunice. We're gonna go ahead to question four. As you can tell, I get carried away too. Question four, convergent ready. So why are these ideas ready for accelerated convergence? Let's say some of our solutions. You gave me some solutions. Why are they ready? I heard solutions with this workforce development. I heard solutions with the analytics um, and something else I mentioned someone else wrote, said earlier. So we have solutions. Why are the solutions that you're putting in Padlet and some of these ideas and some of the ideas, why are they ready for accelerated conversion, convergence? Is there an existing body of foundational research or practice and the needed partnerships? You're gonna see this everywhere, partnerships to implement these solutions in a multidisciplinary way. So anyone wanna take on that? Convergent ready. Why are these ideas ready for excel, not just convergence. These are the two words you're gonna hear on this program, convergence and accelerated. Get it, do it, and do it fast. They're not going to wait forever. Three years. Yes. Okay. We welcome Kiruba back to the stage. Feel free to take okay. yourself off mute. Hi. Um, I'm sorry I had to uh, drop off. Um, so regarding the address question about convergence ready, right? I have a joint appointment in biomedical, biological, chemical engineering, and in food science and nutrition. So there is like, you know, now universities are moving towards these joint hires, which is great. Uh, the, the next thing is when we are developing courses, I have students from engineering and science working together to solve pro pro solutions towards food and nutrition security. So they come up with amazing ideas. Like, you know, you just have to give them the platform and mm -hmm. they just show the direction and they will go and find amazing uh, things. And they're like, they're, 18 years, 20 years old, but the passion that they bring to the table is enormous. I've not seen 10 years before, but this generation is amazing. Giving them that platform and driving that is will create that accelerated uh, yeah. outcomes. All right, good, excellent. And you're right, and NSF knows this, and that's the way these proposals are being designed now. And you're right, I have success in one of my classes, Applied Photovoltaics. I open it up not only to my students in electrical engineering, but to chemists, to physicists, to anyone, environmental science students, they come in there in a free platform to contribute to the solution, to be engaged. And they come up with wonderful ideas. They're so engaged. And, you know, so this is the way, this is how we have to think for these proposals yeah. and, and operate. So I, and, I just want yeah. yeah, I just want to add because I had an, a, a group of students, one from public policy, one engineering student, one food science student, and uh, journalism. So when you put students from multiple perspectives looking at the same problem, the solutions are amazing. Yes. So that's that's the beauty of convergence. Yes, you're right. I agree, and NSF agrees. All right, and uh, in fact, our um, MC Ophelia Wells is a biomedical engineer that's joining us today. So, and she's a um, biomedical engineer with degree from UAB and also from, um, will you share with us from the UK? Sure, sure, yes. Yeah. So I, I study medical devices at Imperial College London. And so this is uh, outside of my wheelhouse, but I will say a lot of the things you all have mentioned today has, has certainly resonated with me. Um, and with that, we'd like to invite Kwame to the stage. So if you'd like okay. to take yourself off mute. Yeah, thank, thank you for allowing me to share my thoughts again. So I said earlier the, you know, the degradation of land. And I think to the solution step, which I skipped was, how do we bring back 
that land that has been degraded as part of energy system and powering our energy to product food, to be food productive, right? So, and I think it's convergent ready because those bring different skill sets. So people from the resource extraction, energy generation viewpoint, but food production and agri science and the social aspect of it but it's accelerated because in the next, at least to, to mid-century, we're going to have to really accelerate our generation of renewable energy in order to starve off the worst parts of climate change. And so since we're going to have to really increase how much we do it, it would be nice to also be able to take, so in, in a way, think of what we've done with gray water and trying to reuse water how about we use land that's already partially degraded so we don't have to use virgin land for food production and limit the impact of our food production on climate change, partly on the not, not taking down forests, but also being able to reduce the footprint of what we need to do in order to generate energy, green energy going forward. So it's convergent ready because you need all these different disciplines to actually address this comprehensively, but you also have a very short time to do this well so that the green energy transformation does not cause even more impact on local communities that live near resource generation and energy generation systems. Okay, all right, good. Oh, Kwame, I can respond to that for five minutes, but I see a lot of hands up, so I'm gonna zip my mouth, but you're on to something there and what to do with that land, but I can't respond. I have to give other participants a chance at the open mic. But that is excellent, Kwame. I hope you put that into a padlet and there's a lot that's happening with this, what we say non-productive land or, yeah. Okay, next participant, next. Yes, yeah, so we welcome Lee to the stage. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Well, thanks so much for inviting me to uh, speak here. Um, I'm uh, just coming out of uh, a, uh, teaching my final blockchain management class uh, last, last week. Students these days can create new applications in one semester. Uh, so here it's, we're using uh, blockchain technologies. I know it gets a terrible press because of how wasteful an energy uh, Bitcoin is, but that's like old generation. I call it the Model T of blockchain. So here, here's a specific thought or suggestion for what's convergence research. Much of what we're talking about here, whether it's uh, managing food waste or managing energy or re re uh, reacquiring uh, land to make it uh, productive, requires some level of uh, decentralized or distributed trust across communities. And that's what blockchain technology can enable. So there's current tools basically your students could be creating uh, what's called smart contracts in a semester that would establish like local arrangements where why people should trust each other to be able to recycle the food from the cafeteria to you know, some other purpose uh, with, with certain constraints or it could be on the energy side. It could be any number of different areas where a little bit of students coding smart contracts could be the, the glue or the platform that could able, enable some of your ideas to go forward. Um, mm -hmm. There's existing tools, but I'm, I'm not going to advocate for any particular one. It's, well, I will. I mentioned one that spun out of the University of Notre Dame, so I'm not taking anything home. Uh, Simba Chain, that, that we, we really like, that's a uh, University of Notre Dame professor's uh, creation, but that's just one possibility. So something where using the latest generation of blockchain tools, and oh, this also fits for certificates and tokens, which could be created readily and easily. That's basically what we're talking about. So you can mm -hmm. do certificates, tokens, new contracts, new products, new innovation, all decentralized, all distributed, but with trust. So yes. that's a big idea and it can be implemented okay. quickly. Okay, I love that idea. And I think that fits in perfectly, Lee. So I hope you recorded that and looking at teaming, I think that's something that should be submitted and go forward. Um, one thing I want you to keep in mind, though, with blockchain technology is think about a sustainable component to that. For right. example, with Bitcoin right now, I think Elon Musk used to sell the Tesla. You can buy it with Bitcoin. And he recently pulled out of that. You can no longer yep. buy his Tesla because 
um, in the production of Bitcoin, it requires so much energy. Yeah, so, There's so, so many, it, yeah, so it's not it's sustainable itself. unless you give it a sustainable energy source. Yeah, well, you don't no, have to go off the grid. So we have a group, we have speakers here that's talking about clean, renewable energy in microgrids. Right. So, yeah, well, you know, so, so Bitcoin is old, or this is the first, it's the Model T, it's primitive yeah. blockchain technology. It works, yes. it's reliable, and it sucks up and wastes energy. That's all yes. true. But yes. the latest systems are like a, at least a hundred times better. So you don't okay. need to use that. Like basically, none of the, none of the, it would make no sense at all to do anything I talked about using Bitcoin as a basis because of just because of how wasteful it is on energy. So yes. nothing I talked about would be using that system. It would at least be a hundred times better from an energy perspective at, mm -hmm. at minimum uh, than, mm -hmm. than than Bitcoin. Uh, okay. So uh, and and. There's there is sustainable sources, so I'll yeah. I'll put a little note on into Padlet about this uh, yeah. and make it clear that I'm not talking about using Bitcoin at all yeah. because of its wasteful energy consumption practices. You can say smart contracts plus microgrids. There you go. All right. Okay. Thank you for that, Lee. All right. Oh, Next, we welcome Jose to the stage. Feel free to take yourself off mute. Uh, hey, uh, thank you. It's, uh, it's an honor to be here. It's, uh, I hear, you know, it's, it's a lot of great ideas. So I just want to comment. Uh, I believe, uh, yeah, we are converging ready, in, particularly in, in academia. Norm, you know, for, you know, we have the disciplinary barriers, right? Like, uh, you know, the discipline, di different di di disciplines are having different languages and you know and there are barriers within disciplines that are at the moment they are improving you know that I have seen a trend toward improving those you know as interdisciplinary research is uh, it is uh, uh, you know being promoted you know they those barriers are you know you know less and less clear one other barrier that uh, that is that within within each discipline, there is also you know as a, a you know within each discipline as an as a professor you have to do you are teaching and you are research and uh, and your teaching duties and and research duties sometimes kind of conf they sometimes they are in conflict uh, because one takes time from the other uh, and sometimes even in departments I have seen that we have the groups of the ones that are mostly focused on teaching and the groups that are focused on on, on research and and those divisions are are not that good and they don't promote the thing so I, I but in the last few years, I have I have seen more integration into this teaching and research. I think we need more. We need more, and um, we need to actively go into try to integrate. You know, like uh, for example, I am really uh, into integrate into into the teaching labs. You know, transforming them more into research labs. You know, and. Uh, and, and, and closing that gap and that and that gap I think is in is in a lot of fields so integrating the teaching and, and research such that they are not divided and they, they they can move forward I think it is an important uh, it's an important aspect and the trend are good and they are and I think this is a major barrier that or you know that that is going to now that its disappearance is going to accelerate and yeah. you know, what is interdisciplinary research and convergent research. Okay. I just got, wanted to throw that comment. Thank you. Jose, that's an excellent point. So I know we're addressing that right now at my institution. I know I, I just, I, I experienced this for my tenure and promotion. Um, but I know on the funding side, I know NSF is funding more research and education. You know, so the instruments are out there. And yeah. there are some of us faculty who are just passionate about this, who we're doing it anyway. But the institution is trying to catch up. They have formed committees to try to have the balance and try to get 
this to be a part of the tenure and promotion process. Other institutions have, are further along, they have models, you know, but you're right, this is um, important. This is where we should be. Um, and, you know, hopefully institutions can move the needle faster or sooner rather than later. But um, you're right, these are barriers and there are solutions to these barriers. And for me, one thing I'd like to suggest, and uh, Jose, I'd like you to keep this in mind, maybe this can be a, a tract because it is a big problem right now. But we have, I think this is question number six, what are some barriers? But what can be a solution that can be implemented in three years? You know, I think a solution for me is I just keep working the interdisciplinary research. But here's what I really want to say. One solution that I've, you know, my strat is my strategy. In my new proposals, what I now do is put course release into my new proposals, you know, but no one told me this. Um, if I can put course release, I won't have a heavy teaching load and to make sure that I put the teaching into the research is not the silo. I have to incorporate undergraduate research. I have to, you know, do the workforce development. If I do all of this, plus put course release in there, that's my strategy to help me overcome that barrier. But we need a systemic strategy, a system-wide strategy that works for everyone. So an excellent point, Jose, thank you very much. And I think that can be put into the workforce development proposal to make a strong proposal for um, NSF. So thank you. Next. Thank you. And, and while we're calling the next person, I'm gonna move to the, the next question. I think we only have two more questions. So this is, um, number five is, and I'll read it out so people can think about it, and then we'll call the next person. And you can come with your current thought in mind. High impact deliverables in a three year time frame. What new technologies, prototypes, tools, apps, and other products can be developed? Some of you answered this already in a three year time frame to yeah, accelerate so, adoption. And so just yeah. to, to step in really quickly, like the Hodges, so we're actually, um, we, we have a very active uh, group of, of team here. Um, oh, we do brainstorming that, that today. Oh, so we're actually, we're mm -hmm. actually past, we're actually uh, on barriers to implementation, which uh, Jose just touched on. So we've, yeah. we've discussed some, some high impact deliverables in the three-year time frame. Um, why is it convergent ready? And so now we're, we're transitioning to barriers to implementation. Okay, and then the last question will be at the barriers to implementation. The last question will be education, workforce development, um, economic development, community development. That will be the last question for today. So not sure where you are, but you're in line. Come with you, either one of those. You know where the answers go in Padlet. So either one of those that you want to address, go ahead and raise your hand and we'll continue. Um, we have, let's see how much time we have left. And we'll continue like maybe 15 minutes. Okay, let's take the next person. Hey, we welcome Tony to the stage. Hi, I was stuck. I was stuck on the last question, but I'll try and roll these all together because I think this is a really important point. All these things are deeply interconnected. So we, yeah. part of our work in complex phenotypes and computational modeling is we have a maize crop every summer and uh, uh, yeah, in fact, I have to get into the lab and help build machines to work on the crop. But uh, a lot of what we do is work on deep learning machines to interpret aerial imagery in useful ways from cheap drones, okay? And mm -hmm. that now requires a lot of, you know, fairly, not really high powered computing, but pretty high performance computing. So part of our dream is to be able to you know, build this stuff out so that then anybody can fly some cheap drones. Maybe you know, we send out, we set up a center to send them out around the world, but to process the data, and people already have this problem, farmers do in Missouri, right? It takes hours to even to transfer the data, right? So mm -hmm. when you start, start talking about moving terabytes of data around the world. This is like for Shugled, okay? So part of, I think why this kind of meeting is so important is it isn't just a bunch of people like me making stuff that we could send out. No, it's really building a global infrastructure, citizen scientists, 
certificate programs, community gardens, uh, ecological monitors, okay, so that we don't recreate the kinds of disasters we already have, um, who can really fit all these pieces together uh, and use leverage this kind of infrastructure. In Missouri, mm -hmm. where I live, most of our rural areas do not have broadband. Um, and one of the reasons why I feel like the time is right now is that finally people are aware because of the pandemic that they need access, they need broadband, they need educational resources, doesn't matter how they're delivered in person or over the Zoom or something in between. All these, and, and the pandemic, the, the good side of the pandemic is it's shown all of these huge inequities that we have in this country and around the world. So now it feels like there's lots of motivation. All the barriers that Jose talked about are really there. I've lived through them. Deidre, you've lived through them. Mm -hmm. uh, I could name some of my other colleagues who have, have or are living through them now. And getting institutional change is really, really slow. This is, uh, of course, we all know this is where funding agencies really have a big role to play. Uh, yeah. So, but it feels like to me, after a long time at some nexus or other, that finally there's enough momentum that if we can push together, uh, maybe we can send this snowball down the mountain and, and start the avalanche for change. So that's, that's all. Yes. Yes, Tony, and that was, that's excellent. And you're right. So Tony, um, I hope you wrote that down, but- um, I haven't to yet, you but and, I will okay. eventually. And to you and I Jorge to and um, Amit, to others out there, here's a track that I see where you're right. Um, there are people right now in tracks with artificial intelligence, machine learning, processing this big data, but you're right. Some rural farmers don't have access to technology and drones and this science that others have. I'm gonna give a company, for example, in Florida, a co-op of farmers have formed together, united, mm -hmm. and they have a company called Land of Lakes. Some of them made, some of us made them know them from their butter that we buy in the book, in the, in the grocery store or their milk products. But they have formed a, this large co-op where they hire the best technology and engineering and apply it to their agriculture. That gives them, to me, an unfair advantage against small rural farmers. So how do we make this, that same type of approach? How do we bring the technology, the sensors, the drones to know what lands to farm, which seeds to grow, you know, real-time data, process the data with analytics? How do we get the internet to them, to broadband? so that you know, we level the playing field. Um, let's, let's think about putting that in a proposal. You know, I think NSF yeah. would be well to hear that along with you know, not just that one, but you know, along with addressing um, the, the issue in institutions to move the needle you know, as far as interdisciplinary research and, and this promotion. I think if we package all of that, I think that would make another great proposal. Yeah. So thank Which you. Yeah, you and let me, ah. let me just jump in to say, extension and co-ops have a long, long history in agriculture. And my mm -hmm. very limited sample of our Missouri farmers indicates they are hungry, they are ready. Yeah. They, yeah. And, 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 and they actually have a lot to teach pointy-headed professors like me about mm -hmm. what their needs really are and what their realities really are. And, and I think that that's that user focused design that we really need as well. Need, yeah, and let's do that because right now I have empathy with these rural farmers right now, they are, they are facing, it's like David and Goliath. They are facing a giant with these conglomerations. These big corporations are coming in, buying up all of this farm land. And now you have a small rural farmer trying yeah. to compete with a conglomeration you know, it's, it's a David and Goliath. So how do we, again, level that playing field? So a lot of small forms are being bought out by these big corporate forms. Yeah. And um, so I, yeah. I recognize Sorry. we have about five minutes left. Um, okay. and, and Tony made a great point, you as well, Dr. Hodges, around 
you know, coming together, teaming together on proposals. Uh, so with that, um, please everyone check the chat. I did uh, type in the uh, link to the Slack community. So you'll see that link uh, for, for coming together afterwards. And we have just enough time to get to our last two speakers today. So we'll invite okay. Jose back on stage and then we'll bring and up then, party afterwards. Parties and then that, that, okay. All right, Jose. Okay, um, so, you know, one of the solutions around, you know, what the, the issues that I brought earlier is, I mean, we are, right now, we are, we are generating a lot of more data than what we can handle and interpret. And usually when researchers, uh, you know, are gathering data, they, they have a specific question, but really their data can answer a lot more questions than, than what they answer, ask for. So mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, if, if all this data keeps being available and we can bring them to the, to the teaching laboratories or, you know, like, and have the students to make real questions, you know, real questions, you know, like there's so much data, you know, they can come up with, and, uh, uh, you know, and they can ask, ask these questions, you know, and use the data that is already existing and, yes. and analyze it and, and we, so, so if we can insert a lot of data analysis, data analytics, yeah. you know, yes. and, and user-friendly tools to analyze yes. because, you know, I think we need to bring uh, computer scientists together, you know, with the, with the other disciplines because the thing is sometimes computer scientists, they make a lot of tools, but, uh, but then they are not really accessible to, let's say, biologists because you need to go to come online. Not that easy. Well, we need to have interfaces, user-friendly yes. interfaces, to be able, and then we can bring all of that to teaching laboratories and to, and we can, you know, transform things instead of doing just reading the book and doing the same thing exercise every year. Yes. You know, we can be, uh, you know, you know, within exactly the topics that are already covered in those. But instead of just talking already thing, things are already done, we can yes. ask questions and question those things that the books are saying. Because yes. you know, a lot, you know, a lot of the things that are in the book are made with limited information. Now yes. we have a lot more information yes. and we don't need to be assuming. So I think one, so basically, yeah, the solution is trying to take advantage of all this data and yes. you know and bring it into the teaching. Uh, which can, you know, far reach more and more people, you know, and this does is not limited to the physical space, right? We can even have people analyzing data all over the world, you know, and joining yeah. something, you know, things because now everything is in the cloud or in source. So I think that's the comment I wanted to, to say. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Jose. And that's an excellent comment. And you're right. If we look back at what and Mike uh, spoke on this this morning, some of the things that they have funded already were projects where people have already taken this big data that's out there. There are a lot of data sets that's out there. Nothing is being done with all of this data. So now some of the cohort, the teams before us, they have taken the data and used using data analytics, AI, they've developed software based on these data sets. And the requirement is that the software that is developed or the app that is developed it has to be open access. But I like the perspective that you just said. Also, let's use it in the classroom. Let's use it in education. But that is what they're funding. So I like that. Yeah. Thank you, Jorge. So yes. we have about one minute left. So we'll invite party on stage. Uh, and if we have okay. you know, folks who want to hang around maybe for a couple more minutes, we'll uh, invite Mimi up next. Okay. So party, okay. feel free to take yourself off mute. Hi, um, so I'm a professor at Georgia Tech School of Building Construction, and my research focuses on supply chain integration for the uh, design and construction industry, for basically for the built environment. Um, so one of the uh, issues in in the con in construction supply chain is the counterfeit products. So products that are um, basically are not original, um, and um, and how it affects safety and quality of the built environment. So I'm wondering how um, this issue is actually, um, sorry, one of the, um, uh, the, the challenges of, of food, so food security, I mean, uh, are we, are, uh, is part, part of the scope, is it um, about the quality of the food and, and yeah, um, 
let's yeah, say it's everything yes yeah, it's not limited it's everything right so um uh, lee already mentioned this that um blockchain is is a good um uh, decentralized technology that can be used for um, ensuring trust um, and I think um, the issue of um, counterfeiting and and the food quality let's say if there is any issue with uh, a specific farm and then the product is already distributed along the supply yes. chain and who knows which grocery store it landed in so how can you um, use the um, um, infrastructure technology to actually track and, and immediately notify all the potential users and buyers so blockchain is actually come to play here so yeah. I, I would be be interested in actually exploring with the team um, the component of food safety um, yeah. and food quality mm -hmm. using using distributed technology like blockchain. And okay, apologies, and everyone. We, we actually have to, to end this session for another session coming on, but amazing points. And we do invite you all again to continue to share um, on the uh, Padlet link that's in the chat. Wait, can we stay? Gina, are you still there? Um, yeah, Unfortunately, been... we can't. We need to get oh, to the next one. We're, oh, we're oh. both you and I are in there, so uh oh, unfortunately, okay, we cannot know that. stay. What's uh oh? What's my well? Let me know where I'm going next. I, I hope you know. And and to everyone else, I want to say, um, Hadis, that was excellent. You and Lee, we do have a breakout on supply chain, but I love the solution you already came up with. So um, we have to continue this throughout the next three days and um, connect. And, and continue to develop that. But that is excellent decentralization and supply chain. But think about how we can incorporate other teams, other disciplines, other stakeholders. How can we incorporate policy, workforce development, education? Keep that in mind, everybody. And with that, excellent today for open mic. Uh, one question, can you put in the chat um, or add it to Padlet? What do you think about this open mic? This was a, a research experiment of mine. You know, yes or no, open mic, put it into the chat. Yes or no, favorable or not favorable. So this was a research experiment to keep everyone engaged and still get information and still brainstorm and still come up with solutions. Yes or no in a Padlet. And with that, we'll call it a wrap for today as we move into our next sessions. And for some, I'll see you tomorrow morning for the opening um, or tomorrow afternoon for some of you for the opening keynote talks. Okay, thank you everyone. Okay, and Gina, can I ask you where I'm going to next? <laughs>